Hello everyone, welcome to the latest edition of the Royal Blue Podcast. As ever, it's been an eventful uh, week, both on and off the pitch uh, at, at Everton. I'm your host, um, Chris Beasley, and as we preview the Brentford game, I'm joined by our Everton correspondent, Joe Thomas, and our other Echo Sport colleague, Conor O'Neill, who's there in the impressive-looking Echo Towers there and um, just off Old Hall Street in, in, in St Paul's Square there. So if I, I start with you, um, Joe, obviously you were at Finch Farm yesterday for Sean Dyche's pre-match press conference for the, the, the trip to West London tomorrow. But as expected, it wasn't just on the field matters that was discussed. A lot of that press conference was regarding um, the 777 partners visit to um, the Blues Halewood um Training complex earlier in the week, where Josh Wander, the co-founder and managing partner of Seven of Triple Seven, as we should be calling them, and uh, Don Dransfield, who I believe is the CEO of the Seven Triple Seven Football Group, both met with Sean Dyche and Kevin Felwell um, to discuss possible matters ahead. I mean, the manager said that they were very relaxed talks, but it did dominate the agenda, didn't it? Yeah, perhaps unsurprisingly for anybody who follows me on Twitter, when when I was heading up there, I, I quite often ask for questions, suggestions, and um, you know I acknowledged in that tweet that a lot of the uh, the open section so for those who who are listening and, and don't know how it works, you know the the press conference is split into two sections. The first one being for the broadcast, which is what you see live on YouTube, uh, and then the second one being what's essentially for for, for print journalists and and that's under embargo and it isn't on the cameras because we then get to filter the stories out as 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 suits our different publications which is why you quite often see a load of a flurry of Everton news at around 10 30 on Thursday and Friday nights and you know no real secret to say that you will do so again on uh, 10 30 tonight as on Friday as we speak so watch out for, for my Twitter feed on that um, so, just, yeah. well, uh, Joe, I was just saying, I think that's an important point you, you make there, actually, in terms of people. And uh, I mean, we often get told, well, why didn't you ask this? Why didn't you ask that? That you're actually pointing out that when you actually go face to face with Deitch, that's not the bit that everyone sees on camera. So I think that it's just important that, you know, the listeners and the viewers are, are made aware of that. Yeah, it's quite interesting, because every now and then yeah. I get people saying, I heard you and you didn't ask the question I suggested. It's like, well, <laughs> you didn't hear me. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, but uh, I mean, I've got quite a lot of good questions on the football inside, actually, this uh, this week. And I've managed to put quite a lot of them to Deitch over things such as the set pieces, the midfield three, um, you know the role of James Garner and where he sees sees him as as being a best fit and, and and some other elements and you know you'll see various stories emerge over over the course of probably the next you know twenty four to thirty six hours in the build to the Brentford game as a result of that so hopefully have covered some of the like I say the football and issues that many people have kind of coming out of that Arsenal defeat and obviously the mm-hmm. run one point from just five Premier League games so far. But yeah, 777 was very much on the agenda in the open section when the broadcasters were there. And, you know, it, it's clear that whilst the regulatory process is ongoing and expected to take some time, you know, 777 aren't holding back in terms of uh, making their introductions and getting to know people and, and, and having a, a bit of an influence behind the scenes there. Obviously, you know, it's been widely reported about the fact that they've, you seem to have issued a, a funneled a loan into into Everton to kind of help with with running costs over the the coming weeks, uh, and then you know Josh Wander he was there at Finch Farm this week, as were several other senior figures. I think four mm. Deitch and Fell. I met with four figures from right from 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 Triple Seven altogether, and you are saying it wasn't particularly heavy on detail. It sounds very much like it was a fact finding mission from them. They've gone to Deitch and they said, well, how have you found things since you've come in? You know, where, What was the state of the squad when you came in? What's the situation you inherited? How has that changed? What's the plan on the pitch? What was the plan in the transfer market? And probably an element of, of, of what do you need going forward? Um, so, I mean, it's, an, it's a statement of intent from, from, from 777. Um, yeah, we may well come on to this. I mean, we've, I've written about this. We've covered this a lot already in the, in the, in the past week since the takeover and it was announced. But obviously, the... Seven triple seven said that they weren't going to engage publicly over the details of the takeover because of um, out of respect for the regulatory process, and it's quite interesting because I'd suggest that there may well be a bit of a lack of consistency there because out of respect for the uh, the process, they may not be 
openly seeking to to reveal details or any insight to their supporters. But you know that respect isn't going so far as preventing them from going to Finch Farm and talking to some of the people who are in charge of what's happening there. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how things like that develop over the coming months. Yeah. I mean, uh, Connor, you were you were in my seat uh, this time last week. You were hosting, so we haven't heard your views on this. But what do you just take from um, seeing about what Sean Dyke said about the, those meetings with the, the 777 top brass who have already been down to Vinge Farm? I think it's interesting that they're already keen to get in and get amongst, amongst things and, and, and find out as much as they possibly can, um, which possibly hints that there could be changes on the way because obviously what we've seen in, in recent time has not been good enough from an Everton perspective both on and off the pitch um, mm-hmm. but I think the, the big the big takeaway for me is, is, is that you know they clearly have no absolute reservations that this isn't going to get over the line and be done yeah. you know, they've, they've obviously got, you know the, the loan that they give the club uh, which is about documents daily this week and obviously the fact that no you know senior figures of 777 have been at Finch Farm. You know, Sean Dyche has met them, Kevin Fellows met them. You've met other people in the club's hierarchy. You'll have met other people in the hierarchy at 77 and that. That just hints that 777 believe that they will be the, the new owners of Everton Football Club and, you know, before the end of the year is, is out. So I think that that is my big takeaway is that, you know, a lot of the work that they're doing here is, is clearly based on the fact that 777 see that there'll be no issues in in this takeover being approved by the Premier League and who there are governing bodies and authorities that have to approve it. And they believe that, you no, know, they will be the new owners of Everton Football Club. So I think it's, it's good that they've met with Sean Dyche, though, and they've obviously spoke about a few different things. You know, we, you know, we described it as informal, didn't he? He didn't really want to go in. You know, it, it wasn't too heavy, I think, it was his phrase that he used in terms of what was spoken about. But I think it's good that they've met him and, you know, he's had the chance to speak to them because that puts a lot of the, the, the speculation that could grow. Because um, obviously, you know, naturally when, Whenever someone new comes into an organisation at any business, there's always rumours that there's going to be changes in the talk, that's going to be changing. Obviously, in a football club, we, all, we often see it done when a new owner or a new majority shareholder comes in. One of the first things they do is, is change the manager to someone who they want, or sport director or football director, which they bring in, brings in a manager which they want. So, I think it's interesting that they've met, you know, Sean Dyche and Kevin Farwell and probably discuss their roles and what they've done and what they think about the club as, as it stands at the minute. But yeah, my, my big takeaway from, from this week is that all indications from this lead to that 777 believe they will be the new owners of Everton Football Club by the end of this year because of the work and, and what they're already doing. Yeah. Joe, I thought it was interesting. One of the lines that uh, the manager came out with, Sean Dyche was asked about how the, how the fans might react to it all. He used um, he said fans were questioning the last regime heavily, obviously last season, and didn't want them at games and stuff. Um, interesting that he's already talking in the past tense. Uh, we know obviously uh, Denise Bar- Baxendale, Grant Ingles, and Graham Sharp all left over the summer, but for now at least, until that deal is ratified, Farhad Mashiri's still there, as is uh, Chairman Bill Kemwright. Yeah, well, obviously they're, they're they're still formally in their positions. So, um, you know, I, I thought the way in which Deitch phrased his response to that question was was interesting. I think it's it'd probably be easy to read a bit too much into into that. I think mm. I think that when it comes to discussing the situation that unfolded last January and February at the club and and the reasons behind the non-attendance of the board directors following you know, the Southampton game onwards. Um, let's be perfectly honest, it's a mess. And uh, I'm sure the people that are advising in Dyke to give him one, um, give him one frame of events, but you know, we know it's far more more complicated than, than fans simply not wanting certain people to attend there. There was a, a much more complex backdrop to that. Um, and obviously, a, a huge sector section of that was, was the severe underperformance of the club, um, and repeated underperformance of the club, and the yeah, the the lack of obvious signs that things were being done to address that, or that there was a willingness to engage with the fans over how things could or might get better. Um, I think he, he probably does kind of hit one of the one of the nails on the head in terms of how a lot of supporters are feeling at the moment, in, in that. I think it's. I try and speak to a lot of people and have done over the past fortnight, and and you know, first when the MSP deal collapsed, and then since seven 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 proposed takeover was announced, and I think it's fair to say that a lot of supporters are conflicted in in what they want at the minute, and 
in terms of, you know, I think it's clear that the status quo is probably unsustainable. Um, whilst also, I think it's completely fair and justified that people have reservations over 777 from what we can see in, and read about them so far, you know, albeit they'll, they'll contest a fair chunk of that. And, you know, as kind of already alluded to, I think it's incumbent upon them if they want that narrative to be challenged for them to, to do that themselves in their own words and direct with the fan base as, as as, as best as, as possible. So, um, yeah, like, I mean, Deitch's comments on that were, were, were very interesting. Um, you yeah, know, the whole situation is just, it's just, it's just very, very complex, isn't it? So. Yeah, quite. Um, Connor, Joe's mentioned there about triple seven and speaking to the fans or not speaking to the fans as this, as this protest, so as this process, that's a bit of a Freudian slip process, um, go go goes through. Um, do you think that there's a that there's a problem there if if they don't speak out that the vacuum is being filled by um, other voices there, and there's so much speculation going on about the club's finances at the moment? It would perhaps be in in both parties' interest really to actually hear something on the record. And I mean, I mean, say actions speak louder than words, and you know there was this obviously the documentation of, of the loan in recent days, but you know, to, to keep a, a silence in this period, I mean, it might be seen as a dignified silence, but it, it does open the door for a whole lot of speculation to come in. Yeah, I think I, think I asked, might have been you, this Chris on Friday last week, yeah. when the news first broke, and I said, you know, if, if 777 don't put a positive case out there as to why, you know, they will be good owners for Everton and why, you know, them coming coming in and taking the state, majority state in the club is, is, is a good thing. And no one else seemingly is going to do that because obviously, you know, like we've reported on the Echo, there is a lot of negativity out there around, you know, 777 and what how they operate and what they do and, you know, what, what people's feelings are towards them at, at, at clubs, you know, certainly in, in, in Belgium at Standard Liège in yeah. January and, uh, and Vasco da Gama in Brazil. But, yeah, so I think that there is that point now where I think, Seven seven have no also need to it's all clarity, I think, just you know, come out and on the record state why they believe, you know, they are good owners for Everton and why you know what their intentions are. I was Josh Wonder spoke when he when it was first announced that they were a, a, a deal had been struck that you know he wanted to engage with fans and stuff like that. But I think he's gotta he's gotta do that now. I think, you know, even though it's quite clear that you know they wanna keep a, a silence until they are formally the new owners of Everton Football Club. But I think, you know, if they're going to go and meet the manager and meet the director of football and go and meet, you know, hierarchy and, and keep it, make themselves known around Alfred's Farm and perhaps go to some park in, in weeks and months to come, then there's no reason why they can't meet with fans and, and other stakeholders at the club and, and, and you know, present what they present what they their case for why they want they you know why they why they will be good owners and, and change the narrative that's around because like, you know, like we've seen the narrative around seven 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 is quite negative and, and people are quite worried a little bit maybe days as to what's to come come with these people. But I think for me, you know, there's no better there's no better pay or personal people to put a case behind why someone should just the people themselves. And I think that's what seven 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 need to do. They need to present the case of why they will be good owners for Everton and why, you know, Everton fans need not worry as things stand because at the minute there's so many narratives flying around, there's so much speculation, there's so much, you know, gossip and, you know, it's it's hard to funnel what's, you know, accurate and what's inaccurate. I think if they just come out and 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 dis- displayed a few a few of their myths and a few of their rumours and and set a few things straight on the record, then I think people will have a bit more clarity and a bit more of an understanding of where things lie and what and what's to come ahead. And just 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 to jump in there as well, that is something that we that we have challenged them to do as well. So we haven't had high level conversations with seven 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 or anything like that, but. You know, as I'm sure a lot of organisations have done. You know, we we've, we've had some conversations with you know people representing them, and and that is some one of the many things that we put to them is saying, you know, there is an overwhelmingly negative case out there around around you. Tell us what the positives are. You know, come out and tell people what they are because you know it's it's not necessary. You know, it's not our job to come and provide that spin. You know, so. You know, it'd be be interesting to see what they choose to do, and I do think, you know, for the reasons we've said, the reasons of of written, um, it's important that something like that happens because if for anybody that's been on social media this week, Everton social media has has been, has been a very very difficult place, and so much rumor and conjecture and speculation, um, including some things which I think are 
you know, a quite dangerous is the wrong word, but, 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 but quite, you know, quite emotive claims, which some of which have been unsubstantiated have been doing the rounds and they, they grow in prominence and then that sparks panic and fear. And, you know, 777, whilst there will be things like non-disclosure orders and, you know, silence that needs to be over commercial deals while they're ongoing and things like that, I don't think anybody's saying that they need to come out and give us a full breakdown of everything that they want to do and the costs and how they're going to fund it and where the money's necessarily, you know, where every penny is necessarily coming from. But yeah, they can, they can give to supporters a degree of insight that would offer reassurance without prejudice in any of the regulatory processes that are, that are going at, at the moment. There is room for them to be able to do that. I mean, yeah, they're already, it seems, providing money to the club and speaking with you know senior figures at the club about you know, how things are unfolding there um you know if they think they can do that without without prejudice in the regulatory process and surely they can you know perhaps engage with fans a little bit about what their plans for Everton are and, and why they think that they would be good custodians of the club and I think that's important because you know labored this point a few times since since the announcement was made but I don't think anyone can really deny that the supporters have played a significant role at this club over recent, um, obviously within the club's history. But you know, when you look at how bad things have been over the past two years, how close the club has got to relegation and how the fans have backed the players on the pitch when it's really, really mattered. And not just at Goodison Park. I think back to some of those away showings at, at Leicester in the Lampard season and then maybe Brighton and, and Wolves last year. I don't think it's that much of a stretch to say that the support helped give the players a little bit of extra that might have just been that bit of extra that got them over the line. I don't think anybody thinks that this is going to be an easy season for Everton. So if if, if 777 come in, take over, um, and, and you know, take over the club in January, there's every chance that for the first few months of their, of, of their tenure at the club, there's still going to be a degree of risk around the Premier League status of Everton. And they're going to want the very. They're going to want everything that they can in their favour to help, obviously support Everton. You know, to help selfishly from them to help protect their assets. Because obviously Everton's worth so much more if it is, um, if it remains a Premier League club, and that'll mean needing the fans on board. So, I think it's probably a little bit too complacent to say we're not going to say. You know, we're not going to go into much detail, or we're not going to engage. And maybe they are planning to do so. You know, that, that remains to be seen. But I think we need to put out that they need to do so just because they'll be asking so much from the fans come the minute that their deal's approved, if it is approved. Um, showing the supporters a degree of, uh, of of respect and treating them with a degree of maturity and trust before that process would probably go a long way for a fan base, which I think has probably been you know, left underwhelmed by some of the communication engagement that they've received from the club, from the club that they love over the last few seasons. So I, I really do think it's important it's in, in, in their interest to, you know, to, to come out and to be a little bit more open about their plans. You know, what is the plan for Goodison? Can they give assurances that they're going to, you know, once, once finished, they're going to keep hold of it. You know, what's some of them been asking about today and then we'll, we'll come back to, you know, what's the plan for the Goodison legacy project and, you know, the hugely significant um, piece of planning for, you know, for, for an important area of Liverpool and, you know, going forward after the, you know, the the stadium move, should all that go to plan? As we hope it will. So, a little bit, a little bit of insight, I think, would go a long way. I think it's 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 important that they take accountability and the communication is open and transparent more than anything, because there are things that we've you know often criticised and highlighted that the previous regime, in which you know Sean Dyche referred to his press conference on Thursday, haven't done. You know, and, and I think. For 777, there's no better time to go on the front foot than take some accountability, be open and transparent about what your plans are. And look, you know, we're not, I think we've all got to be realistic that they might say some things or things might get said that people don't approve or don't like, you know, but, but that's life. <laughs> but at least be open and honest and, and, and you know, be, be, take accountability and, and, and tell people what is going on and what the plan is. You know, people might not like what the, the, the 777 have got to say. People might like what they've got to say. But for me, I think it's just a case of, you know, have some accountability and be open and transparent in that communication, and uh, and you know, be, be be give fans the update and, and and the insight that they you know they deserve and and what what is needed. 
Yeah. Moving to on the field matters. I mean, there is a, a Premier League um, fixture at Brentford. Obviously, Everton's still waiting for that first victory of the season. And a little over 24 hours from, from when we speak, uh, Joe and I'll be heading down there to the cap. Well, Joe, I, I noticed um, this morning you obviously had that piece when you spoke to Sean Dyche about the set pieces. And that's one of several issues, which has obviously been uh, afflicting Everton in, in, the, in the recent um uh, matches and uh, an area which you'd think should actually be one of one of their strengths. Um, it's been shown that they've got the tallest team in the Premier League when it comes to to average height, and obviously the, the delivery there and the people who can get on the on the end of them. And, and the manager admitted it's not been good enough. Yeah, when you when you when you're trying to score goals in the way that Everton are, you have to you have to do the simple things well, don't you? And and some of that is, is clearly attacking set pieces, which I think have been hugely underwhelming so far this season. And when I asked Sean Deitch about it at Finch Farm on Thursday, he was pretty honest and, and, and said that he agreed. He said they haven't been good enough and, and it's something that they're trying to address. And we saw... A, we, I feel like we saw a big improvement in attacking set pieces when Deitch came in. Although when I was kind of looking at it, I was struggling to think of that many goals that Everton did actually. Obviously, there was the James Tarkovsky header from a corner from the Dwight McNeil corner in his first game, the winner against Arsenal, and then there was a Yerry Mina ninety, however ninety plus, however many minutes equaliser at Wolves. But other than that, I couldn't think of too many more. But it did feel like Everton were far more threatening from set pieces once Deitch came in. That hasn't really continued into this season, and, and like I say, when he struggled for goals in the way that Everton are, you need to make the most of that. I think we all heard the collective groan around Goodison Park when Ashley Young's in, you know, out, I remember when Ashley Young's, I can't remember if in swinging or out swinging, but his, when his corner just was comfortably claimed by David Ray at, at, at Goodison Park on, on, on Sunday evening. And, you know, it feels like that's been a bit of a theme. You know, I understand Abdullah de Corey's goal against Sheffield United came from, came from a corner, but, you know, Everton need to be making more of this year. You know, they've got that height advantage. They've got players that are good in the air attacking the ball. Um, and they've got players that aren't especially good in the air, but are very, very big and 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 have the potential to at least kind of cause trouble in the in, in the box and from 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 balls into the box in there as well. So I mean, it needs to be improved. It's it's interesting because obviously a lot of them are being taken by Ashley Young, and if you look over the course of his career, I mean, his set pieces have been you know a, a huge part of of his armory. I think um, when you look back to that England run to the World Cup semi finals in two thousand and eighteen. Yeah, the amount of, of goals, the headers that came from 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 his balls were, were you know was astonishing. You know, it was one of the themes of that of that tournament, and you just think, I, I don't know. It, it almost a lot of people have been saying this to me, and I, and and I I wonder. I mean, you could think this on many levels, but one of the many kind of hexes and curses that seems to be over Everton over recent seasons is the amount of people that are good at set pieces that turn up at the club and all of a sudden can't seem to find their target, or if may well be that they're finding their target and the players aren't attacking them in the in the right way. But uh yeah, it's something that needs improving and I think I think Sean Dyche is aware of that. Probably might see McNeil on a few more of them and perhaps James Garner if, if he uh if, if he gets into the into the team. Yeah. Just hope that Ashley Young just isn't <laughs> got too old to to take a corner kick. I mean, I mean, I was the way he took that throw in at Aston Villa. That was a bit concerning. But on the, on the other end of the spectrum, I'm told Johan Cruyff, when he was first started out in the game, was so weak he couldn't even lift a corner kick. But uh, he, he ended up doing all right. Um, Connor. Um, other than that, I mean, what would you what would you most like to see at, um, at Brentford in, in terms of an improvement from ever? What do you think they they need to sh- to show to sort of flush that Arsenal display out of the system well where, where do you start <laughs> for going off but based on last Sunday's evidence yeah. obviously I think that the big player in one is is an attacking threat isn't it you know looking like we can score a goal <laughs> as bad as that sounds um, because I don't think last week we ever looked like we was going to we were going to really truly test David Raya um, in the Arsenal goal I think it was it was always you know we were, we were always at arm's length to, to Arsenal one one of the big things for me, and it's it's been a big thing for me for a lot of the season, is Everton's inability to retain possession and keep the ball. I just think you know, time and time, I know it got referenced a lot because it was really bad against Arsenal, but you know, I think against Wolves it wasn't great, and time against Sheffield United it wasn't great. But you know, certainly from a midfield perspective, Everton's inability to be able to retain possession, keep possession, and and, and almost you know put passes together just just doesn't seem to happen, and I think. 
something somewhere's got to change in that because you know that almost comes into play with attack and threat, isn't it? You know, because if you haven't got the ball, you're not going to score a goal. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. if you haven't got the ball, you're going to do a lot of defending, which, you know, you look at Everton's recent, you know, recent games, that's exactly what they've had to do. A lot of defending and, and not much of an attack and threat. So for me, it, it, they've got to be better with the ball. They've got to be braver with the ball. They've got to, I think the midfielders have got to take more chances and, and have a bit more confidence in moving up the pitch. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously the attack and threat is one, but for me, I think it's just that retaining possession and being a bit braver on the ball because I think. Far too often in the last few weeks, Everton just have been, you know, abysmal when it comes to retaining possession, and and that shows because, like I say, you know, if you haven't got the ball, you're not going to score, and if you haven't got the ball, you're going to have to do a lot of defending, a lot of work, and you know, you saw against Arsenal, you know, Everton were forced to do a lot of the chasing because Arsenal retained possession and knocked it around quite comfortably, and I just think that's got to change. It's got to change quite fast because it's becoming a major problem now for Everton. Whether that means Sean Dyche has to change his midfield, whether you know he has to change the way he plays. I think he's got to do it now because it's a glaring issue that needs addressing because, you know, like I say, we're not going to score if we haven't got the ball and, you know, things are going to be a lot tougher if we if we don't have it. So, for me, the big one is retaining possession and getting a real foothold in the field because I think it's become far, far too easy in, 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 so far this season. Yeah. I mean, Joe, one thing that was put to the manager this week, because um, obviously he had, he had uh, Beto and Dominic Calvert-Lewin both available for the first time Last Sunday, and I, and I know I did a piece during the week of pointing out Everton had the fewest um, crosses of any team in the Premier League last weekend, which was a, a bit of a damning failing on Beto on his, his his home debut, not to get the ball up to a six foot four inch centre forward. But do you think there's any merit in, in the, the possibility of going for a dual attack? Obviously, Dykes played four four two extensively at Burnley, but he, I mean he hasn't gone that way at all at Everton, and he sort of did allude to the fact that a lot of teams are free in the middle these days. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure there is at this present moment in time and certainly don't think Deitch thinks that way. Um, whether he whether he will in the long in the long term, I think that is something that he will consider. But I think in order to do that, he's got to find a central midfield pair that he's comfortable with. And, I, and I'm not sure that there's a two within the four fit options that would fill me with a huge amount of confidence Um from a defensive perspective rather than anything else, especially when you consider that Everton, it looks like he wants to play with wingers. You know, it's not like last season where you, you had Dwight McNeil and Alex Awobi almost as, as as flat wide midfielders. You could do a lot of defensive work and as well as, as well as get forward. I think that the introduction of Arno Danjuma um, probably means that he wants to, play less through the middle and more get the ball out wide to then get it into either Calvert-Lewin or, or, or Beto. Um, and I think if you remove some of that protection from out wide, then it creates even more pressure on the centre midfield and then even more if there's only two of them. So it's, it's I mean, it's a tough one. I think the centre midfield does need to improve. Um, like I, I think I'm probably in the minority on this, but against Arsenal, I, I did see... I thought I did see a game plan. I thought there was. I thought there. I thought I could see what Deitch's side, what he wanted his side to do. I just thought they executed it very poorly. And I think that's essentially because the centre midfield just broke down, didn't have any composure on the ball, couldn't pick a pass when it when it won the ball, and and just couldn't retain any kind of, of, of possession. And it may well be that yeah, you know, that has been Deitch's favoured midfield three over the course of his time at the club so far, and it proved successful in keeping Everton up, but. It might be that it's time for a change and you know bring James Garner perhaps into a centre midfield role as much as anything just to freshen it up just to let them know those incumbent free that their their positions are under threat that there is a challenge to them and hopefully that will kind of increase you know, raise standards known as a bit of competition. I think if I'm perfectly honest, if I was to my my thoughts on two up front if I was to go down that way with this Everton squad I'd be more inclined to have Arno Danjuma as a second striker so yeah, him yeah. playing off one off yeah. Beto or Calvert-Lewin I think I think he can play that support striker role quite well I think he's good coming onto the ball I think he offers a bit of a threat with the ball at his feet as well and, and then that perhaps gives the opportunity to you know when they're fit to play Harrison and McNeil out, out wide and in a four four two, and you know, Harrison, someone that we know can do a lot of defensive work as well. So perhaps that the defensive work that those two players could do out wide would perhaps relieve some of the pressure on on the midfield, which means you could then have two there, and you could have 
you could have Dan Juma in the in the Decore role, um, but probably starting a little bit higher up the pitch. I think that's probably the way way that I'd be looking to go. Yeah, Connor, it's it's ironic really that we're saying this after Neil Mope has has left the club. You know, somebody operate as a two in a, in a front pairing, and then obviously he's gone back to Brentford. He can't play tomorrow against his his parent club. But they're now coming up with this. I mean, there's been plenty of classic big man, small man combos over the years. But what were your thoughts on the, on the, the two big men potentially going up together, Beto and uh, Calvert-Lewin? I, I don't think we'll see it very soon. Yeah. I don't think as much as people want it, want it to happen and, and, and want to see something different. I don't think we'll see Calvert-Lewin and Beto together any anytime soon. I mean, we're saying all this. It would be perfect, Sean Dyche, wouldn't it? Tomorrow, that you know, be four four two and better on Calvert Lewin start up top. So, you know, we've seen this before, haven't we, with Sean Dyche, where we, we we speculate that something's not going to happen and we don't believe something's going to happen, and then he absolutely care balls us. I think you know, Crystal Palace away last year when Calvert Lewin looked like he was only fit enough to start at the bench, and he was thrust in for ninety minutes of of, of action of action at, at Selhurst Park. So, you know. I, I get why people would like to see it because I think it's something different and I think it'll, it'll ask the opposition a lot more questions than what Everton have asked them uh, so far this season. But I actually think what, what Joe said there in terms of Dan Juma possibly playing as, as, as a forward will, is, is what we probably would see more because even though when you think of Sean Dyche at Burnley and all that's made of the four four two and stuff, Ashley Barnes played more off the centre forward than as a centre forward. I mean, more often than the case was, was the four, was the the, the person who started alongside the big number nine. It wasn't, you know, Ashley Barnes plays as, as, as kind of a two-man attack. It was, he played in between, you know, midfield and, and the centre forward. So you could very easily see, you know, Dan Juma picking up that role. And obviously that would then enable once Jack Harrison's back fit to, for, for Dice to play Jack Harrison and Mike McNeil on, on either flank. But I think the, the big problem, like Joe said, it is the midfield pair and, and, and combinations because, you don't know whether I don't know whether at times it's felt a bit like Garner, or just a Garner guy, uh, Amadou and I and Abdul Hadi are just playing together because that's all Sean Dyche has really got at his disposal, and, and and you know he hasn't really got anything else to do and change it up, and he doesn't maybe want to be too brave, brave and bold and, and go four four two and play you know drop one of them out and play it two. So I I think it'd be good to see Cavalier and Beto play up top at some point to see what what, what could happen. I think it'd be you know, very much of the chaotic nature and very much balls into the box and plenty of crosses and, bom- and bombard in the box, which, you know, I haven't supposed might want to see, but I don't think we'll see it for a, a long time just yet. And I think there's more chance of Dan Juma playing off better or, or Calvert-Lewin. But with in saying that, like I say, you wouldn't be surprised if we all got curveballs at half four tomorrow when, when team news drops. Yeah, right. Predictions um, time. Um, I was saying um, Everton... Still waiting for that first Premier League win of the season. I'll, I'll kick us off. I'll, I'll go with um, one all, and unfortunately, that that wait for the elusive first win to go on. But you know, another point on on the board. Um, Joe, your thoughts? Yeah, pretty similar to be honest. I I take a point there. I think Brentford are a good side, and I think that they're quite good in some of the areas that Everton struggle at. I think it was. It's quite interesting watching this game last year, and albeit that formations have changed and personnel have changed. Obviously, Evan came away with a one-all draw courtesy of Anthony Gordon's goal, but they were battered. <laughs> you know, Brentford missed so many great chances, and I saw the highlights to one of the early games at Brentford this season when they played Bournemouth, and I think they drew two-two. And it looked a very similar game there where Brentford just kept hitting the woodwork and it just, you know, like I'm a little bit worried about, about I don't think Evans should go into the game with fear, but I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about it. And I think my kind of, the one thing that I'd probably try to stress is I, I, I don't, there's a very fair argument to have over the disappointment of Everton fans that, they're going into a game away at Brentford as, as as perhaps the underdog. You know that that isn't something that I think many many would have would have uh, predicted. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, and I can understand the frustration in that. But I think it is on reality of this game, and I kind of think that perhaps because I saw this a little bit after Arsenal. Whilst it's fair to be concerned that if they come away with a defeat, tomorrow, unless it's like an Aston Villa style performance where they just mm. don't turn up. 
hopefully they do get a positive result. But if they don't, probably that's not the time to panic. I think the time to judge where this Evan side is and what it could potentially do this season. I think the lens through which to more accurately view that will probably be the Bournemouth game the week after. That's that's with me work on the basis that they they, they they simply have to beat Luton the week before. I think they can beat Luton. And I think the gulf between Luton and the rest of the Premier League is, is enough that Evan could beat Luton and not learn we wouldn't learn anything about where Everton are, but that Bournemouth game after, I think that's that that's that's the one going into that international break where at that point I think we can then fairly assess how the season's looking. Connor. Well, I'm going to shock both of you. Go on. And say 3 1 Everton. Oh. For two reasons. Yeah. The first, there's something inside of me that thinks we're going to get something like we did at Brighton last season. Okay. Where it's just going to be shell, shell shock. Like, where's that come from? Um, the, I don't know why. I just think there's, yeah. there's something There's something that it's going to be like Brighton all over again. And, and I actually wouldn't be surprised as mad as this sounds, if they did win comfortably, like, like she's on a Brighton last year and then struggled like her last next week against that own to Luton. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so well, oh, yeah. After, after, like the, after the, 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 the great win against Ben Brentford type thing and then into, into Luton. He gives the, the one hand and takes with the other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the second reason is because Thomas Frank done Monday Night Football, Jamie Carragher on yeah. Monday night. Yeah. Cool. Now, very good, very interesting. Thomas Frank's a you know really good manager, really good character. Good friend, but a good friend of Sean Dyche as well. Yeah. We've seen time and time again that sort of thing backfire on managers, haven't we? Where they go yeah. on, talk about the tactics, talk about why they do this, why they yeah. do that, and then the team get wellied at the weekend because you know it comes back to haunt. The TV appearance comes back to haunt. So they're my two hopes going into tomorrow. Maybe the hopes more than anything, yeah. but they are my my two hopes that. You know, Everton are going to shock the footballing world and wow. pick up an expected three points. Yeah. The first three points of the season. Frank yeah. talks, but like the Brighton yeah. five on, just just free one. Fair enough. Well, on that positive note, I think it's a good time um, to end. Um, I've been your host, Chris Bees. I've been joined by Joe Thomas, Connor O'Neill. This has been the Royal Blue Podcast. To win this beautiful Hummel Everton FC 2023-24 home shirt couldn't be easier. All you have to do is make your way to the Royal Blue Everton FC YouTube channel, subscribe and leave a comment on any video saying you want to enter the competition. That's it. It's that easy. Remember, become a subscriber and leave a comment. Entries close on September 24th at 11pm UK time and a winner will be drawn at random on September 25th. Good luck. Thank you.